Hello, book two. I had an appointment bitterly early this morning, and uh, that put me within striking distance of the Brattle Bookshop uh, in downtown Boston, my favorite used bookstore, a place that I have been going to for years and years and years. Uh, and I knew I was going to want to pick me up, even though it was a little bit cold to be browsing. Uh, the reason why it matters that it's cold to be browsing, for those of you who knew, is that the Brattle, in addition to being a used bookstore, a great used bookstore, has a sale lot next door where all, it's got thousands and thousands of books that are outside. So in cold weather, in, in icy, breezy weather or whatever, you just have to endure it. <laughs> you, just have to, you just have to endure it. If you want to do that, if you want to look around at those books, and that's mostly what I want to do when I go to the Brattle, then you have to, you have to put up with inclement weather. Uh, so I did. <laughs> I did do that. And I got a stack of books that I don't need at all. I don't need a stack of books, but I, I wanted to pick me up and it was a lot of fun and I found some great stuff. So I want to go over those with you. Uh, and the first uh, two things that I want to show you here are the way I usually start off these brattle halls with mass market murder mysteries. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, I started reading mass market murder mysteries and was loving them. And then the pandemic got a little serious and I stopped. I, I moved to science fiction and whatnot. But then as things leveled out and it became obvious that it wasn't going to be the bubonic plague. It wasn't going to be the end of human civilization. It was just going to be a really bad scourge. Uh, I started gravitating back towards murder mysteries and loving them to death, just loving them to death. And, uh, thinking the whole time about March mystery madness, a big booktube event that's coming right up. It's right around the corner. March in March, myself and a bunch of other booktubers are celebrating murder mysteries for the whole month. Um, and the Brattle Bookshop in downtown Boston a while ago, 2019 probably, or early, yeah, or maybe late 2019, bought a huge collection of murder mysteries, just enormous, including thousands of mass market paperbacks. And they had the usual suspects among those mass market paperbacks, but boy, oh boy, browsing those shelves, browsing that collection really gave me a reminder of just how many murder mysteries have come out by authors who are long gone, who wrote one, maybe two books, maybe three, and then disappeared completely, or who wrote a bunch and then disappeared completely. Uh, so it's been great. And I, I ration myself. I, I don't get an armload of those. I get a couple at a time just to try out all kinds of authors. Uh, thanks to the generosity of a, a half a dozen of you, I have a huge number of murder mysteries in ebook form as well. Uh, but, uh, I'm okay with duplicating if you're paying a pittance for the for the printed book, and I was. The Brattle is nice and affordable. So I got two of those. First one is this. James Melville, The Wages of Zen. The, this is the very first Superintendent Otani mystery set in Japan. In this case, set in a Zen monastery in the winter, where a whole bunch of different uh, tourists from abroad, all sorts of different people, have come to this monastery in order to study Zen. And one of them, an Irish priest, is found dead face down in the snow and uh the superintendent has to figure out who among all of those candidates is the one who did it or is it perhaps one of the zen monks you wouldn't think so but you never know and i remember seeing this series in bookstores but i don't think i've ever read one and if i remember correctly uh james melville is a pen name uh, for the author's real name which is not going to come to me i don't think but i know that the, the author under his own name wrote uh the what was it the chrysanthemum throne or was it the chrysanthemum throne something like that it was a history of the of of the imperial japanese families that was really good i don't have a copy of it but i but i did i have had a copy of it but one way or another uh left-handed exercises in somebody writing murder mysteries when they have a, a full career elsewhere fine by me <laughs> absolutely fine by me and then this next one is charlotte mcleod uh this is the family vault and uh, I don't believe I've read any of her either, even though I remember having a whole shelf of her in bookstores. And this is a, a story set in Boston, set in on, on Beacon Hill in Boston. Her two main characters uh, live on Beacon Hill in Boston. And the, one of their very elderly relatives is about to pop his clogs and wants to be buried in the family vault. And they want to check the vault first at one of Boston's very old burial yards to make sure that it's in working condition, to make sure that it, that it's, you know, the roof hasn't fallen in or anything like that. Uh, I, I believe the beginning of this book points out that, that most 
grave sites in and around Boston proper and across the river in Cambridge are historical sites, so they're not active burial grounds anymore. But that isn't true if your family maintains a vault. <laughs> and a couple of them do. And the main characters here do, so they, they get somebody to open the vault. They find a corpse in there that isn't theirs. <laughs> That's a great way to start a murder mystery. So, But I don't think I've ever read this author. So I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm just realizing now that my ergonomics are wrong. Uh, once again, <laughs> my ergonomics are wrong. Uh, this next one is definitely something that I have had. I've had it in beautiful trade paperback reissue from time to time. And thanks to the generosity of that cadre of ebook people, I've all, I also have this in ebook form. But so this was just a pure sentimental buy, but it was a dollar. So I was willing to do it because, like a lot of people, I remember these books from this setup, from this cover illustration, this look. This is Smiley's People by John Le Carre. Uh, this is the uh, third or fourth George Smiley novel where he is, it's the climax of his battle with uh, his KGB counterpart, Carla. Uh, and this look, that kind of classic 70s cover artwork, that, this is how I remember these books. All of them, all of the La Carre that came out at the time came out like this. And I don't know when I'm ever going to see them again. The, like I mentioned in many videos, mass market paperbacks, especially vintage ones like this, do, they're not going to crop up in bookstores anymore. Bookstores aren't going to crop up anymore. Bookstores are mostly gone. But even if they, do, if they aren't, they're not going to do it. Just simple attrition is going to cause a lot of these things to just disappear, and they're not made anymore. Uh, so I grabbed this. This was uh, uh, the first Smiley novel, I think, in 10 years. And then there was a long gap until the next one. The, the last George Smiley book is called Legacy of Spies. And Le Carre kept going back to this character, and he kept writing novels long enough so that I could actually review Legacy of Spies for a national newspaper. That was a thrill, an absolute thrill. Uh, and I didn't, you know, there weren't many books after that before Le Carre was gone. So at least I got to review a Smiley novel in C2, which is great. Uh, but I haven't read Smiley's People. I haven't reread this in forever. So uh, I'll gladly give it a try. And I'll, it'll be it'll be extra sentimental, I admit, to read it in this format. I'm hoping, the synchronicity of the battle being what it is, that whoever got rid of this maybe got rid of others. That would be great. If I could have two big boxes full of the mass market paperbacks from this era, just this look, this feel, as I encountered them, I would take them all even if it meant taking the, uh, the the copy of The Exorcist that came at the time. Uh, then we have uh, a couple of supernatural things. The first one is extremely bittersweet, but I couldn't pass it up. This is the novelization of the Werner Herzog movie Nosferatu. So it has, the, it has pictures from the Werner Herzog movie, and there are stills on the back there. Uh, and I wouldn't care. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't care at all. But this novelization is by a writer named Paul Monette, uh, who did other novelizations. He not he wrote the took a check for uh, Scarface. He took a check for the I think Predator. He took the, wrote the novelization for Predator. It was a good gig if you could get it. To get that kind of thing, you're usually given a brutal deadline. Just brutal. Here is the script breakdown. We need a uh, hundred thousand words, and we need it in three weeks. <laughs> something, something brutal like that. Uh, and he always came through. This author never wrote anything that I don't want to read, and I didn't have this. And I don't have a lot of his work. And uh, he was a great guy. He was a fantastic guy. He wrote fiction and nonfiction. His his nonfiction. The pinnacle of it are a couple of AIDS memoirs that are immensely worth reading immensely. He also wrote a handful of novels that are immensely worth reading. They are really, really good. I think they got uh, paperback reissues with really pretty cover art about 20 years ago. Uh, he uh, died of AIDS. He was He's one of the that legion of people that would still be with us and still be writing great stuff, if not for that. So, But uh, 
I didn't see anything else by him there, so I'm pretty sure that whoever, whoever dumped this was just dumping mass market paperbacks, and this just happened to be one of them. I didn't get it for Nosferatu. I got it for, for Paul Lament. So. <laughs> uh, and then this next, this next mass market paperback, this is the last of the mass market paperbacks. I got this, even though it's in not all that great condition, because believe it or not, it's in much better condition than the last mass market paperback that I had. I have gone through probably six mass market paperbacks of this book. I read them, reread them. They fall apart because they're not very well made. I've never seen a trade paperback. I've never seen it reprinted in a trade paperback. I've never found a hardcover. So I just keep getting them over and over again. And I just recently destroyed, finally, the last mass market paperback that I have. So now I have another one. This is the horror author Robert McCammon. And this is a book, The Wolf's Hour. It's very different from all the other horror that he wrote. This is about a werewolf operative during World War II, Michael Gallatin, who is a, a, a handsome, athletic, cultured man, appears to be in his 30s, who is clandestinely fighting the Nazis and who is also a werewolf. And he's not the, uh, the Lon Chaney-style werewolf. He's in complete control of, of whether or not he shifts into wolf form. Uh, and he gained that control at the hands of a particular mentor of his, there's a little, uh, a little scene here, uh, where where he asks he asks his mentor, "Can't I stay a wolf forever?" And uh, the wolf the 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 mentor says, uh, "Being a wolf is a wonderful thing, a miracle. But we were born humans, and we can't let go of our humanity, even though the word human shames us to our core sometimes." Do you know why I'm not a wolf all the time? Why I don't just run in the forest all day and night? Because when we take the form of wolves, we age as wolves, too. If we were to spend one year as wolves, we would be seven years older when we return to human form. And as much as I love the freedom, the aromas, and the fine wonder of it, I love life more. I want to live as long as I can. Uh, and there's, there's little meditations like that all throughout this thing. In addition to tons of atmosphere, great characters, and a fantastic, action-oriented, extremely intelligent plot. No offense to this author. I know he has lots of fans on BookTube, for instance. But I have never found any of his other books, even Swan Song, to be anywhere near as good as this book. I don't know why that is. May, I don't even know 100% if that's right. It might just be that the subject matter here appeals to me more. One way or another, this, you can see it's been read and loved, but it hasn't been destroyed. My last copy was, was virtually destroyed. I will reinforce this and do the best I can, but I still imagine I'm going to need another copy next year. But anyway, anyway, and then we'll move on. This next one, uh, somebody already gave it a, a library laminated cover, and it's a find. It's I have I have a series of ancillary props here just to make this a little less boring for you, and I, I have a prop for this one. Uh, the University was it the University of Oklahoma? Yeah, University of Oklahoma Press. For a long time, uh, a long time ago, fifty years ago, they sixty years ago, they did a series of centers of civilization, little hardcovers, studying discrete cities through the the lens of a famous person a famous time period uh and it was great the whole series is great i wish i had them all uh but i only have uh, until today i only had of course my favorite one boston in the age of john fitzgerald kennedy by walter muir whitehill uh who i knew and who was a friend of mine and who this is just a, an absolutely terrific book about boston caught in the gaze of a certain age. And today I found another one that I've never owned before. This is by Elizabeth Reifstahl, and this is Thebes in the time of Amenhotep III. Elizabeth Reifstahl was an archaeologist. It was mostly what she did. I think this may have been her first book. Uh, and Amenhotep III came up on this channel just the other day. I was at the Brattle. I did a Brattle book haul uh, where I got a, a book called The Heretic King about Akhenaten, who's famous as for trying to do away with the state religion of ancient Egypt and establishing a kind of monotheism and changing the visual iconography so that he looks very distinctive in carvings and paintings and whatnot. Uh, but as I mentioned in that in that hall, Akhenaten took that name for himself. His royal name was Amenhotep IV because he was the heir to Amenhotep III. And Amenhotep III was a great pharaoh, ruled for a long time, half a century. Uh, and did a lot of great things, and is fascinating. And this is this is a book that's going to look directly at him. That's fantastic. How I wish that this series continued. How I wish that it did. I notice on the flap here, very, very uh, tantalizingly, a whole bunch of 
volumes that I don't have. There's Dublin in the age of William Butler Yeats and James Joyce. Uh, there's, uh, let's see here, Antioch in the age of Theodosius the Great. What I wouldn't give to have that. There's uh, Constantinople in the age of Justinian, which I have had. I don't, I don't have that now. There's Athens in the age of Pericles. But imagine how much more you could do with a series like this. And what a great idea it is to do. Imagine uh, Prague in the time of Kafka. Imagine Vienna, Freud's Vienna. Imagine all the things that you could do if you if you did it this way. I think it's tantalizing, but I was happy to find this one. Absolutely happy to find this one. Then we're going to have, next we're going to have three in a row that are science fiction fantasy, SFF, uh, which is not usual for the Brattle. They don't, they don't get a whole lot of it. And uh, these are not only SFF, they're all hardcovers. Uh, the first one is something I have tried to cozy up to this series so many times. And I viewed this as just uh, the serendipity of the gods pushing me to try it again. This is Camera of Chaldee by Catherine Kurtz. This is the first one in hardcover. The first chronicle of uh, the Chronicles of Camber of Chaldee. These are a kind of alternate historical medieval Britain uh, in which humans live alongside a race called the Durini, which look human. Uh, but they have mental mental abilities that look like magic they they are they are not completely human and there is naturally tension between the two groups between humans and Durini. uh and <laughs> i read camera of Chaldee when it first came out and just thought it was dull just dull and then eventually it came out with this daryl k sweet cover and i thought when i saw the cover i so bradley thought well yeah the cover certainly matches the book because look at that it's a it's a Daryl K. Sweet cover, so it is pretty. But look look at look at that. I mean, first of all, what, do people have to duck to go underneath this staircase to go down those stairs? And and you can't even give us the drama of a guard who's dead. It's just a guard who's got a minor flesh wound in his shoulder. That that is your cover. <laughs> but, but one way or another, this the, these first few books center on on one particular Durini, Camber of Chaldee. And I'm going to give it another try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it another try. I don't actually remember this coming out, these books coming out in hardcover. So I, I'm, I don't know. I might, I might have to check with, uh, with Mark at Richardson Reads about what these things are, whether or not he remembers them coming out in hardcovers, especially this next one. This is Artifact by Gregory Benford. One of this classic 80s cover. It's just, that's why, the cover's a large reason why I got it. I remember seeing this as a mass market paperback in bookstores forever when it didn't have this cover. But I got, I got it because you can't pass up a cover like that. Uh, and this is this is a novel. I think it was the one he wrote after Timescape. He wrote a novel called Timescape that won every award that wasn't nailed to the floor. And then he took a few years, I think, to write before he wrote another one. But he was a working scientist. I told he was a working physicist. So it's like he was not. He was on you know on a beach drinking rum or whatever. <laughs> uh, and then he wrote this thing about an archaeological dig in Greece where an American archaeologist finds an object, a black box with a with a, a kind of a horn sticking out of it. And she doesn't know what to make of it, but she knows she doesn't want to leave it in the hands of, of, of war-torn Greece, so she smuggles it back to Boston and, and examines what it is then, and gradually the truth of it comes to light. And I remember this being pretty good. I actually am, would it be in the minority for old-style science fiction fans in that I actually remember preferring this to Timescape. But I haven't read Timescape in a long time, so maybe maybe uh, I would think different now. But I, I'm going to have to ask Mark if he remembers this coming out as a hardcover. I don't remember this coming out as a hardcover, and I was I was in bookstores all the time I, back in the 1980s. I would I think I would have noticed a new hardcover with an eye-catching cover like this. But I wanted to read you uh, just a bit of what you can expect when Benford goes off topic and starts writing about science in the middle of his novels. Uh, this is. The most important lesson in modern Einsteinian physics was the fact that space could be pathological. Before Einstein, the world was a place of billiard balls, remorselessly predictable paths, and serene certainty. No physicist can now recall without a thrill the moment when he left that arid Newtonian landscape and entered a Lewis Carroll-like world where time was a fourth dimension. Space curved giddily, and honest witnesses could blithely disagree about the simplest facts of what happened where and when. Einstein linked space with the matter it contained, returning, to fi returning physics to a depth and mystery it had lost. 
By making the universe a partner in, in the construction of its own geometry, Einstein admitted the possibility that it would contain pitfalls, traps, bizarre spots. As soon as he showed that matter could curve space-time, the possibility arose that curvature could be unbounded, infinite. A particle proceeding through such a region of time-space, of space-time, would find a point beyond which it could not go, a spot where its own existence ended, a singularity. Uh, and that that kind of uh, that is that is just the narrator, but in, in often the science talk is done here through the characters, uh, especially since our archaeologist immediately enlists an expert when she gets to Boston to figure out what this thing is and whether or not it's dangerous. Uh, and you, you get the sense there in that little glimpse of the, not only that Greg Benford knew science, knows science, but also that he's willing to fudge it a little for dramatic purposes, since of course one of the foremost things that Einsteinian physics says is that the universe doesn't have odd spots where the rules don't apply. That's one of the foremost things that it says. But <laughs> but one way or another, I'm going to give this another try. I couldn't pass up this hardcover for a dollar. So I'm going to give it another try. Greg Benford has never done it for me. No offense to the guy. He's won every award there is to win. He is a lionized figure in science fiction, if he's still alive. I'm assuming that he is. Uh, no offense to him, it's just he's one of those science fiction authors who just pumps out things that don't work on me. Elizabeth Moon, Elizabeth Moon is another one where they just generally don't work on me in the way that some of their contemporaries do. So it's not a matter of generations or, uh, you know, the taste of the time or anything like that. It's just a, a pure taste type thing. I recognize that his books are well done, but <laughs> well, I'm going to give it a try. And then this next one, the last of this triptych of science fiction and fantasy and hardcover, is a science fiction, a fantasy novel that I didn't think was in hardcover. Again, I didn't know that these things existed in hardcover. I'm going to have to ask uh, Mark or maybe Sean or Jason if they remember these things or what I've got here. I have no idea. Uh, but this is the uh, the writer writing under the, the name S.P. Somtau. He originally wrote under uh, something closer to his own name. He is... Uh, descended from royalty, <laughs> has a mouthful of a name to prove it, but he eventually took the wise counsel of friends and, and editors to simplify his name to S.P. Somtau. Uh, had a long publishing career in science fiction and fantasy, including for Timescape Books, that was named after the, uh, the Greg Benford novel, but uh, never really became a name to conjure with. I believe he is still alive, but I don't think he writes anymore. I think he mostly composes symphonies and other hoity-toit stuff like that. But this is a big novel by S.P. Somtal called Moon Dance. And I only remember this as a trade paperback. Am I wrong about that? As a mass market paperback, am I wrong about that? I don't remember this as a hardcover at all. And I, the reason that I'm so befuddled about that is because I think I was in the country. I think I was around in bookstores and would have noticed it, but... One way or another, this has a killer premise as a werewolf novel goes. It's a war and peace of werewolf novels. I've got I got two werewolf novels this time around uh, to go with a, a new book that I just got in the mail, The Werewolf in the Ancient World. So, but the, this is the the, uh, the killer premise here is that this is a werewolf western. It takes place in the 1800s, the late 1800s, and the United States government is busily wiping out and relocating the Lakota people in order to fulfill Manifest Destiny. They're either killing the, the Sioux or they're penning them up in reservations. And among the Sioux, for countless millennia, has been a small group of people from whom are always drawn the shamans who give spiritual advice to the tribe. And that group can shape change. They, can, they are werewolves. They can shape change at will. And the other strand of the plot is that across the ocean in Germany, in the, in the forest, in the black forest, in the wilds of the woods, there is, all, there is a, a German clan who has an age-old ability to shape change, to be... They, they, uh, so in other words, the, the, uh, the shaman among the Lakota in one strand are the source of the New World mythology about wolfmen. And, and the, the wolfmen, the werewolves of this German group, this German family group, are the source of all of the medieval folklore about werewolves in the forest and whatnot. And the patriarch of that family decides to move his family to the New World. He decides to move to the West because he figures they won't be persecuted there. There won't be anything to stop them from growing, expanding, preying on people. The last thing in the world they expect is that they're going to encounter another sect of werewolves. And uh, I, I read the mass market of this, my mass market, and it uh, absolutely fell apart. 
absolutely fell apart. I was using rubber bands to hold it together by the time I got to the end. And I wasn't reading slow. I just... By the time I got to the end, I w it was just in pieces. I remember I gave it a Viking funeral because I finished it in the afternoon when I was out, uh, was camping with a group of people, not anywhere dangerous. We were just, it was a campground near a road. So it wasn't, it wasn't my kind of camping, but it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a boisterous group of people. And at night we had an enormous bonfire. We just decided, the other people that were there just decided to make it theatrically big. So it was this enormous bonfire. It was great, absolutely great. So much fun to sit around that, tell stories, sing songs and whatnot, and eat, of course, a huge amount of eating. And everybody loved my dogs, so that, that made it even better. And I had finished this book that afternoon, and I thought, you know, why would you even save this? You can't read it again. So I threw it into the fire. I gave it a, I gave it a, a glorious burial in flame. <laughs> but I can't wait to read this again. And I had no idea I would ever see this in a hardcover. Uh, so a blast of science fiction and fantasy to get us, to get us along there. Next book is uh, Natural History. It's a collection of columns that were written by a very engaging writer for Natural History magazine. Stephen Jay Gould, you think? No. <laughs> no, it was the columnist for Natural History Magazine before him. This is Marston Bates, and this is A Jungle in the House. Uh, and it's this is mainly a collection of essays about the weird menagerie of animals that he had in his home. And you might think Gerald Durrell, you might be getting vibes like that, exotic animals like, you know, a marmoset or whatnot that, that live in the house. But he also writes extensively about the animals that live there anyway like cockroaches or or bugs of that kind there are a good solid if i remember correctly there are a good solid couple of columns about cockroaches in here where at one point i mean it's been a long time since i read these columns i was glad to find this book but I, I, at one time he mentions that everybody has a sort of a sweet spot for animal horror a particular kind of creature that really gives you the heebie-jeebies some people snakes some people spiders he admits that for him it's cockroaches and yet he has these things in proliferation, two different kinds of them in his house. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, at one point, years and years and years ago, I was reading one of these columns, and, the, and one of those cockroach columns, they are the memorable ones in here, but I'll give the whole thing a reread. At one point, he, he mentions scientists say that by the time an, a cockroach reaches adulthood, it has perfectly functional, strong wings, but they seldom fly. And when they fly, they only fly for tiny little distances. And in the column, he mentions, well, I don't know what those scientists think of as tiny little distances. I've had them fly all the way across a room. <laughs> and I read that part out loud to someone I was living with at the time. And she went nuts. Just nuts. She couldn't sleep for days. She did not know that cockroaches could fly. <laughs> and was not the same person once she learned. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm, it's not just a cockroach process. I'm looking forward to reading this whole thing again. Uh, then here, this next one is something that I have a prop for. A couple of years ago, uh, I got this in the mail from Publisher. I wonder if I still have a sheet in here. So we can, yeah, I do. I still have the pub sheet in here. Uh, this was from 2017. Uh, so we would have known each other, right? You might have seen this on this channel. Uh, this is by Helen Smith. And it is a biography. It's called An Uncommon Reader, and it's a biography of Edward Garnett. Uh, and there he is. There he is. There's young Wilson himself there. And I, I read this and really liked it. If I remember correctly, it made my list for the best biographies of the year, 2017. I read it and really liked it. I thought it was a terrific job. And the whole time that I was reading it, I was thinking, boy, you know, there was an earlier biography of this same guy that I really enjoyed. I'll never see it again. It'll never, I'll, it'll never turn up. But the battle will provide, and it did today. This was is George Jefferson's biography of the same guy, Edward Garnett. Uh, There's a different cover. There he is as, as an older man in the rare instances when he could be asked to wear clothes. <laughs> he wasn't a big fan of wearing pants <laughs> any more than any other civilized person is. <laughs> uh, and this author does a great job, a complimentary job. Not, it's not any better or any worse with Helen Smith. It's just a completely complimentary job. And uh, boy, oh boy, I'm all for it. I will read. I will read any biography of this figure. Edward Garnett is uh, is. <laughs> I can just hear some of you seeing the author's name and remembering the Jeffersons, <laughs> the sitcom. The Jeffersons are moving on up to the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky. <laughs> this is not that George Jefferson. <laughs> this is this is a different George Jefferson. <laughs> and Edward Garnett was 
now would be known as Constant Garnett's husband. The, the famous translator of all the Russian literature. The, the translator really brought Russian literature into the, the lending libraries and the, the reading clubs and the, the bookstores of ordinary people. He was her husband, and he was also an amazing literary light in his own in his own right. He wrote innumerable reviews, book reviews, what I wouldn't give for a big, excuse me, a big collected volume. I don't know if such a thing exists. Maybe in the UK there is such a thing as the collected reviews of, of Edward Garnett, but not in America. Uh, but he was also a, a, a mentor figure. He was, he he got to know authors and gave them a roof over their head, helped them out with a rent check if they needed it, and took their manuscripts, talked about their manuscripts, enthused, cheer-led, helped them, inspired them, gave them stern but very uplifting practical advice. He was the figure behind so much literature that we think of as being the sole creation of its writers. So much of that has Edward Garnett at the back of it. Uh, that it's it was great to find this. Of course, there's a part of me uh, that gripes, even in the midst of my of my good fortune. There's a part of me that gripes that I'm showing you two biographies of Edward Garnett, and I'm not showing you any biographies of Constance Garnett. But <laughs> that's all right. I'll get a lot of her in both these books. So I was very happy to find this. I, I now that I now I have the book that I was looking for when I was reading that other one. I'll reread this one and just have them together on the shelf. Uh, and then the last thing that we'll do for today. Uh, is another biography, and it's huge. <laughs> it's two volumes, back when that was the normal thing to do. This is a, a two-volume biography, Life, Times, and Letters, of Charles William Eliot by Henry James. <laughs> Not that Henry James, but his nephew. <laughs> this is Henry James' Henry James's nephew. This is William James's son. Uh, and he wrote a two-volume biography of the great Harvard University president, Charles Eliot, who was from the most Brahmini of Boston Brahmin families is from the Eliot family. So, so not only the poet T.S. Eliot as a scion of this family, but also the historian Samuel Eliot Morrison. And Charles Eliot was that to a T. From that family, had a hand in all sorts of the, the, the family stuff, married a Peabody girl. Uh, and this is just a, a wonderful two-volume biography of him, the type of thing that you find at the Brattle and you don't find anywhere else, and you don't find it in any other used bookstore. Uh, and this this will go really well. I, I, I haven't read this in forever. In fact, I don't think I've read the whole of the two volumes through. And Henry James is really good. You won't hear that often on this channel, but, but nevertheless, he's really good. He does a really good job. Uh, this is an authorized biography. The family opened all their vaults to him. They gave him access to all of the documentation that he needed. And they exercised no control over him whatsoever. So uh, this is this is full of uh, letters. It's full of illustrations and whatnot. If uh, it's it's too bad. I don't think there are any illustrations of what Charles Eliot looked like when he was undergraduate at Harvard uh, in the 1830s. I don't think there are any pictures of paintings or anything from them. And that's a shame because he was a super hottie and had that. He had a particular. I wonder if the frontispiece has him as an old man. Oh, okay, even even worse than an old man, it has him as a, a marble bust. <laughs> but you'd never guess from from that carving. But well, throughout his whole life, he, Eliot had a particular look in his face. Friends used to comment on it. They they used to call it thrilling because it was. He had a, a look of of hungry humor. Where he was. He wasn't a nihilist, he wasn't being sarcastic, but he was ready to find the world funny in a very cutting, very intelligent, but very loving way. And that look was stamped on his face in the nursery because he had it when he was an undergraduate at Harvard in the 1830s. And long flowing hair plus that look was ooh, ooh, <laughs> quite effective. <laughs> but anyway, there were, no, there were no Peabody girls allowed at Harvard when that was true, or would have married a lot earlier than he did. But this was... This was an absolute find. I mean, and, and you know, with the Brattle, unlike with uh, uh, perhaps a lot of other used bookstores, I didn't have to go up to some sort of rare and collectible room or past, uh, you know, a wall of protective glass or whatnot to find these. They were out in the sale lot. So I was able to just grab them. I will uh, clean them up. I will reinforce them. I will also make dust jackets for them and then give them a lifetime of use. I don't need these in any other form. So that's great. So there you go. Another hugely long video. And yet, 
my subscriber count keeps going up. I mentioned this in another video. What, what somebody pointed out to me that my subscriber count had a huge jump just recently and is now an appreciable way towards the halfway point, towards 10,000. We're, we're well past 9,000 on our way to 9,500. Which means if that happens, if that stays true, then this channel will hit a mind-boggling 10,000 in 2021. I, I, am I going to have to put on pants for that? I, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge and then burn it to cinders when we come to it. <laughs> in the meantime, I just got to make your peace with the fact that when I talk to you, I like going long. So we'll do a Steve Pyramid and then I will shut up for the day. So we have Charles Elliott. I mean, what a find. What an amazing find to go with all of my other 19th century two-volume Boston biographies. Then anyway, Edward Garnett uh, by George Jefferson, uh, a, an earlier biography of, of that of, of, of the, a real, you know, backstage figure in literary history. Uh, then we have A Jungle in the House by Marston Bates, a collection of his columns for Natural History magazine. We have Moon Dance by S.P. Somtow about warring clans of werewolves. We have Artifact by Gregory Benford. This thing is found in an archaeological dig and may be very dangerous. We have Camber of Chaldee by Catherine Kurtz and the Society for Creative Anachronism. I'm going to give it another try. I am going to give it another try. We have Thebes in the time of Amenhotep III. Fantastic. So I now have two of those books. We have The Wolf's Hour by Robert McCammon and that will last as long as it lasts. We have Nosferatu, the novelization by Paul Manette, who's a gay novelist I strongly recommend. We have Smiley's People in this vintage old paperback. Uh, we have The Family Vault to bring us back to Boston, a murder mystery set in Boston. And we have The Wages of Zen, the very first in a, in a series of novels starring a Japanese superintendent. So there you go. That is our, uh, uh, our Brattle Book Hall for today. Snow is predicted for tomorrow and the next day. And then it's the weekend. So I don't imagine I'm going to be back to the Brattle until next week. Uh, well, if that happens, I, you will be the first to know as I will come back and talk your face off for an hour. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm going to disappear. Uh, so I will see you tomorrow. Thank you, BookTube.